In this segment, we're going to talk about who IO psychologists are. When we look at the larger field of psychology, Division 14 is the Society of, for Industrial and Organizational Psychology. And like I talked about in the previous lecture, this is an applied area of psychology, applying psychology to the workplace. And we have um, the idea that we come from the scientist practitioner model, as I discussed earlier as well. And there is a very interesting podcast that explains a little bit more about how this plays out in reality. The scientist practitioner model is an ideal and most people within the field come from a somewhat balanced um, perspective of, of being scientist and practitioner. However, there are tensions between those who are leaning towards the scientific work and those who lean towards the practitioner. If you're interested in further information about this, um, it is available at the SIOP website and the link is below there. So what are some demographics of IO psychologists? I'm going to base my information here on SIOP's 2016 Income and Employment Survey. This is a survey that's done fairly regularly every few years and they send out surveys to a portion of the SIOP membership and the responses that come back are what the report is based on. So keep in mind this current report is based on responses from 2015 in which 1,069 people responded. There were many more that received the survey but this ends up being a 24% response rate. So keep in mind, these might be biased in one way or another. And it seems just from looking at the data that it seemed to be younger people, younger in the field who replied to the survey at a higher rate. The field has become more balanced in gender over time. In 1982, when the first survey was sent out, 16% of the survey respondents were female. In the most recent survey, 49% were female. So this is a particularly um, male-dominated, was a particularly male-dominated field for a long time and now has become more balanced. Also in terms of degree level that people have achieved, there are more master's level terminal master's level um, members within the organization. So in 1997, when they asked for the first time how many people had master's degree versus doctoral degrees, 7% had master's degrees. And the most recent responses, 23% had a master's degree. So we're becoming more balanced. There are more people with master's degrees who are becoming and staying members of SIOP. And if we look at the field more globally, 3% of the respondents were international affiliates. So there are not a lot of people from abroad who are participating. However, I will mention that there also is a European work psychology organization that many European members belong to app. There is no data that I have on this. However, I will talk about my personal experiences in what I've seen over time and also look a little bit at, at APA and what has happened in the general field of psychology. So when I began going to the SIOP annual conference in the late 90s, it was primarily a white male dominated field. It has become more diverse, both in terms of gender, as we saw, and in terms of racial makeup. In general psychology, the American Psychological Association put out a report from 2015, which looked at um, racial makeup, as well as other aspects of the organization. And 
found that Hispanics and African Americans were particularly underrepresented and whites overrepresented. I don't think this would be a, a big surprise to any of you. But what this means is that they're comparing percentages of racial groups within the population and looking at the percentage of those people in the profession. So for example, there were about 14% less Hispanics practicing psychology than the percentage of Hispanics in the working population. And how they find this out, they use information data from the 2013 American Community Survey, which is conducted by the US Census Bureau. And when they compared the results from 2013 to those they received in 2005, they found that there has been a dramatic increase in minorities working in the field over this time. So even though there are a lower percentage of minorities working in the psychology field, this has increased. Also keep in mind that we cannot necessarily extrapolate from general psychology to IO psychology. For example, when we look at psychology as a field, females now occupy about 68% of those positions, um, but IO is more balanced. It does tend to be more male than, than psychology overall. So let's look at the work settings. Those who have doctorate degrees, and this is coming again from the PSYOP income survey, there are several different work environments in which they work, types of organizations. Many of the doctoral degree holders work in academics. And as you can see, that's 36% but there's also a very large percent in consulting and in industry. And what this all means, consulting would be people who work for a consulting firm who go out and have contracts with particular companies to provide IO psychology services. Those who work in industry work for a particular company. So for example, Home Depot. Home Depot has a group of organizational psychologists who work within their organization and do the work of IO psychologists for their organization. We also have many people who work in the government, and this could be for the Department of Labor, the military, um, federal government positions. And there are a few people with doctorate degrees who work in nonprofits. For those with a master's degree, the makeup is quite different, particularly in terms of, as expected, there are not many academics with a master's degree. Those who do have a master's degree and work in an academic environment may or may not be in teaching there are primarily master's degree people working in consulting and industry. And then there's a substantial amount as well working in government. So if you're interested in some personal stories of why people got into IO psychology or how their career has developed over time, there is a list of autobiographical histories of the past presidents of the PSYOP organization. And it's interesting to read through these and see what brought people to the field. It is not always that people knew what it was, and in, in many cases, they didn't. They fell into it in one way or another. They were often inspired by professors that they had in college. And so it's just interesting to look through. Um, if you get a chance, Please go look at a few of those. So what do IO psychologists actually do? What tasks do they do? What technology do they use? Do they interact with people a lot? Or do they interact with things or data? In order to answer these questions, I'd like you to take a moment and go to the following website. This website provides you is a, an online 
directory of jobs. Back in the earlier part of the 1900s, the Department of Labor made a list of jobs and categorized those. They each have codes. And as you see here, there's a code for industrial organizational psychologists. This directory of jobs used to be a big fat paper book that people would look through in order to find descriptions and find information about each particular job that is available in society. This is now been put online and is much more user friendly and is useful for students like yourselves who might be interested in looking up what potential careers are out there. So take some time, look through this. Also try to answer those questions that I asked on that previous page. What tasks do IO psychologists do? What technology do they use? And do they interact with people, things, or data? Okay, so what training is required to become an IO psychologist? Well, in general, you need to have at least a master's degree. Most people, as you've seen in the PSYOP survey, have a doctoral degree and degrees. Usually these are PhDs, and there are a few CIDES. For those of you who don't know what that is, it is a professional applied psychology doctorate. Usually those are um, clinical psychology programs, but there are a couple that are industrial organizational. So what about licensure and regulation? This is something that is an ongoing debate for IO psychology. Well, it differs by state. Alabama and Georgia in our region both require licensure for some to practice IO psychology in a manner in which they are getting paid to do that work. The PSYOP survey found that 18.8% of PSYOP members of the respondents to the survey were licensed or certified in some manner. And like I said, this is a debate. Some states require it, some states do not, and some within the field feel like it's an important thing, particularly in terms of proving that they have particular background and knowledge to provide the services that they want to sell to an organization. However, those who are against it, there are several reasons for that. One, it's very expensive if you are um, paying for this yourself and you don't have a, an employer who is paying for it. This tends to prevent academics from doing consulting work on the side because they can't just go out and offer their services to get pay. So they tend to not do that. And what that means is that scientist, scientist practitioner model becomes even more tense because those academics who focus on the scientist, scientific aspects don't tend to do the applied practitioner work. Also, these exams tend to be very highly clinical. It is the same exam in most states to be licensed as an IO psychologist as well as a clinical psychologist. It is a test to be licensed as a, quote, psychologist. It doesn't matter which subfield you're in. And because of that, and because of most people who are getting licensed are clinicians, the tests tend to be very, very highly um, clinical in the content. So let's look at the state of Alabama licensing requirements. From section 32, thir excuse me, ex from section 34, 2640, part A, it is specifically prohibited that any individual or organization shall present himself, herself, or it to be presented to the public by any title incorporating the name psycho psychological, psychologist, or psychology other than so licensed by this chapter. 
for those who are employed by a recognized research laboratory, school, college, university, or governmental agency or department. They may represent themselves by the academic or research title conferred. So for example, I am more of an academic. I can call myself an industrial organizational psychologist because that is the degree that I have received. However, nothing in the section shall be construed as permitting such persons to offer their services to any other persons or organizations as consultants or to accept remuneration, so pay, for any psychological services other than that of their institutional salaries, unless they have been licensed under this chapter. So in other words, I cannot offer my services and get paid for that work to organizations unless, out, outside of teaching, unless I get licensed to do them. And further on in this licensure law, it spells out basically that um, organizations can do psychological techniques for their own use. So for employment placement, evaluation, promotion, or job adjustment of their own officers or employees. However, they cannot sell or offer those psychological services to others outside of their organization unless their psychologists are licensed. So some of you may have been waiting to see these type of figures. What are the salaries? Now keep in mind that these are median salaries. We like to use median because using the mean or the average gets gives greater weight to outliers. And in terms of salaries, you may have <clears throat> in terms of salaries, you often have outliers on the high end of salaries. So your median is going to be lower than the mean. So for doctoral degrees, overall, the median income is around 118 or 119 thousand dollars. Keep in mind this is greatly variable. So those who have self-employed consulting firms, they have a median salary of about $200,000. Academics have a median salary of $103,000. Now, even within academics, you have very great variability because about about half of those academics are working within a psychology department and the other half working within a business school. Those salaries in themselves are often greatly different. As you can imagine, business schools tend to pay much better. For master's degree, the median salary is $84,500. And again, this varies greatly. Those in the banking or finance industry on the high end have a median salary of about 105,000, whereas those who work for local government are gonna be much lower and have a median salary of 68,500. So here are some related careers. Um, if you looked in detail on the ONET results for IO psychologists, you also saw a list of related careers. Some of these overlap with that list and some do not. Um, human resources and organizational behavior. These are both topic areas that come out of the business school. They're basically the same information. Human resources are the industrial topics that I talked about. Organizational behavior is more of the organizational topics. We have ergonomics and human factors, which 
is the study of the interaction of people and things that we create. So you may have heard of a chair being ergonomic. Well, that's because it works well with the human body. And this field is particularly interesting and important in the workplace as well because of the instruments or the um, environment that we work in. We want an environment in which workers are not hindered by the created things in the environment. Industrial engineering is another area, setting up the work situation to be the best that it can be. Employment law, we will be talking about um, the equal employment opportunity laws, civil rights and disability laws, as they apply to human resources decisions. Organizational communication, there are people who specifically focus on communication in organizations. And institutional research, I mentioned universities. These are departments which collect data, they find out how many students there are, how many applicants there were for a particular year, how many were selected, and provide reports to both administration and the public in general on what the state of the institution is. Um, here are some references that I used if you're interested in looking at those in more detail.